Sam and Ben Martin, thank you so much for making the time. To talk. Thank you, Ahmed. Thanks for having us. You bet, you bet. Um, so I, as, as I was just telling you guys before we started recording, uh, the hope here is to illustrate in through our conversation how to let's call them disciplines, the high level uh, philosophy and um, computer science or information technology um, come together uh, in, in fruitful ways. And not just philosophy, actually. Uh, the reason why I sort of remember reached out to, to Sam a few weeks ago is because um, phenomenology of all philosophical branches, he was um, making the provocative statement that uh, <laughs> that uh, it, it can be made uh, to good use in solving concrete problems. And, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with phenomenology, but definitely not to, to your to the extent you guys are. I found, as I said, I found that provocative and very intriguing. So I immediately reached out to him and said, well, of all the philosophers, you're telling me that, um, that the phenomenologists are the ones who are actually going to to, <laughs> to contribute concretely. And so he started a conversation and here we are. Um, so anyway, I'm providing context to the folks. Um, uh, and uh, you guys are brothers. And can I just for the sake of, of this conversation sort of give you like these unfair labels, like one is the philosopher and the other one is the computer scientist. Just I so think that's that totally fair. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Okay, well, let me start with this and I'll address it to the philosopher. Ben, right? Is that, is that yes. how we're going to work with the labels? Okay. That'll do. <laughs> that will do. All right. Um, what is what's phenomenology? Uh, probably the majority of the folks, maybe I'm being condescending, never heard that word. But what is it if, if you were to explain it in a nutshell to somebody who's curious and wants to understand what it is, um, but has no idea or hasn't dabbled much um, beyond perhaps the one class that they took in college in intro philosophy. Okay, um, so phenomenology is a movement in, in uh, continental European philosophy in the early 20th century, founded by a man named Edmund Husserl. Uh, probably the best, you know, the way he understood it was that phenomenology is a theory of evidence, like evidence as such. What does it take to support knowledge claims? Um, his approach to it is that he, he looks at consciousness and does something similar to an introspective psychology, um, trying to get rigorous description for how we arrive, or like how do we constitute evidence or how do we say we've arrived at the appropriate evidence for a knowledge claim. Now this is in contrast to some other approaches that might say, what does you know, natural science tell us about the human act of knowing? And he flips it and says, no, what is it about consciousness that allows us to arrive at the concept of science? Now, anyone who's familiar with the etymology of science knows it just means knowledge. Um, so he was very sensitive to this and wanted a rigorous account of how we arrive at the concept of science, how we would justify scientific claims. Uh, so the entire project is epistemological and it follows in the tradition of Descartes and Kant. So it, it's also transcendental. So, you know, in a nutshell, you could think of phenomenology as a rigorous description of consciousness that's really a kind of transcendental introspective psychology. You know, it's really a grand attempt to have a theory of evidence to support all of our claims to knowledge across the sciences. Okay. Um, and would that be, um, would that be in contrast to say, I don't know, empiricism? For instance, or what would the, like what what how other what other way would somebody go about collecting evidence and constructing knowledge? That yes, you could contrast it with empiricism, which is more a term that comes from nineteenth-century philosophy. Um, 
and might have been set in contrast to the transcendental philosophies of Descartes and Kant and others. Um, Husserl wants to avoid uh, his criticism of empiricism might be that you've already made a commitment. You're, you're going to deal with these kinds of facts that show up, and that's going to be your standard for assessing knowledge claims. He wants to go a layer deeper and say, what is it about consciousness that allows us to grasp facts? So facts are going to be very important for a, a large swath of knowledge claims, maybe not all of them. Uh, for example, you don't need facts to prove certain mathematical theorems. I mean, unless we could stretch the meaning of the word fact, but you know, historical facts are irrelevant to certain um, to the proof of certain mathematical theorems. They might have been proven in other ways. So um, that that's one way to think about the contrast is that he's trying, at least Edmund Husserl, in founding phenomenology, is trying to have an epistemology that doesn't um, prejudge uh, the issue or make any unexamined theoretical commitments. Okay. How, how is that um, different from, say, the logical positivists, which I think were, which I think were his contemporaries, right, in the early 20th century? Yes. Because they, too, make this proposition that, you know, um, facts are there, they exist, uh, and we, um, we, can, we, can, we can have access to them outside of theory, right, um, before theory. And one of the biggest, uh, I guess, one of the biggest um, criticism of logical positivism is that fact and theory cannot not coexist. They have, um, the facts are always laden. You approach the world with certain lens that allows you to certain see certain things, sort of like Kant, right? Um, except that Kant was at, 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 the, at the more fundamental level, right? We, we, we never have access to, to things directly, it's only through our categories, right? So how is he? How is he different from the logical positivists in that sense? You know that I myself am not all that familiar with the logical positive positivist tradition. So I, I I'm not going to give a good answer to this. I would say that he is interested in the the same fundamental project as Kant. So more of his effort goes into description in you know, describing the structures of consciousness by which we constitute different kinds of facts and different kinds of evidence for different kinds of claims and in different sciences. So I don't have the sufficient knowledge of logical positivism to really draw a sharp contrast there. Well, um, I, I, I think, um, I mean, they're, they don't, they're not saying anything profound, those guys. I mean, they just say, okay, facts, facts, you know, something, you know, is, is there and you look at it and, and then, you collect the facts and you come up with your uh, theory, right? So you see 10 things of a certain type and you, you call, it, call it a phenomenon, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you go from there, sort of from the bottom. So, so Husserl, Husserl's work is gonna, he's gonna put a lot on the work that it takes to classify the different kinds of facts. Mm -hmm. um, and this is more of his early work, um, what's sometimes called, um, blanking on the, uh, on the, the phrase they use in contrast to genetic phenomenology, static phenomenology. So he's just what again? static phenomenology. Right. Uh -huh. He's attempting to look at all the different kinds of spheres of evidence that we have that would support um, the different kinds of sciences that we recognize. So his was a very grand epistemological project, kind of like Aristotle. You know, how, how do we get a picture of the sum of human knowledge? So that was part of his thinking. So I don't know how much he's going to disagree with the logical positivists. It's just a matter of problematizing the, the attitudes and the uh, distinctions that we make pre-theoretically, you know, before we get to the particular or specific sciences. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah. Um, so the key thing, I guess, from that I'm picking up is that um, it's an inward investigation. Is that right? Um, it's, a, it's a Cartesian way of, um, of investigating um the world as opposed to you know being like a blank slate and receiving and then recording right so there is something going on already ahead of perception is that uh, close to to what uh, it's close said? i want to be i want to be very careful 
with the word inward. It's certainly Cartesian, mm -hmm. but I think there is a mistake of the metaphors employed by Descartes as if there is something inside. I mean, there's really no inside or outside. Um, when, I would, when I would teach this in class, um, I actually signed Augustine and we used Augustine for, for breaking uh, apart the modern mind-body problem. Mm -hmm. um, because I think Augustine's got a couple of phrases where he uses the world is that which, he uses the word mind as a verb. The world is that which we mind. Mm -hmm. Um, and by returning to the, the concept of mind as a verb, we see there's really not a mind world division. I mean, nothing that we do in philosophy really concerns, you know, the physical happenings between my ears. I'm not trapped in my brain. The, the mystery of consciousness is deeper than that. You know, we're already always engaged in the world. Um, so phenomenology, at least in its classical Husserlian form, kind of, it tries to start before any kind of mind-body problem, and it's not working with the same inward, outward. The idea that we arrive at an objectively existing world, that, that is, in Husserl's words, an achievement. And he wants to understand that achievement and not take it for granted. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, um, I guess my next question, just so that we can um, get, get to something concrete that the audience can understand um, is tell me how at high level um, how one would use the, the the concepts and the categories and the way of, of of solving the world of knowing and understanding. Um, maybe give me an example. Uh, maybe learning, right? How does one learn? I don't know. Um, that would basically get us to understand. Oh, I see. So this is at least the strategy or the approach of someone uh, who 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 wants to explain phenomena in a in a phenomenological way. How would you go about doing that? You know, as an by giving an example. Well, um, I've got two two ways I could go here. One, I could give a very concrete example about what Sam and I have worked on in sure. applying some of these concepts to AI. Secondly, I could give a kind of more generic example where the how to apply it is not immediately clear, but it's a pretty good conceptual tool that we get out of phenomenology for starting to approach certain problems. Okay, let's so do I'll a generic one first. Okay. Um, Husserl talks, you know, he has a lot of work on the importance of forming habits mm -hmm. where um, if we look kind of one of the basic functions of consciousness is associating different elements and saying these are like or these are unlike. And that's a function that starts, you know, right, that, that might be the primary function of consciousness. It's linking, um, I don't even want to say phenomena, but elements of experience. This happens, so if we were to try to use a phenomenological model for or get a phenomenological description of infant consciousness. Mm -hmm. When a baby is born, it doesn't recognize physical objects in front of it. It takes a lot of time where it integrates its experience of different senses to get concepts of objects like we have today. They don't, the baby's not born and sees mom and dad, it sees a wash of colors. And it takes a long time to piece it together, make the distinctions, get a sense of distance. In fact, until, um, until we have some experience with locomotion, we really don't have a concept of depth. Um, there have been experiments I know. I'm familiar, Dan Zahavi is someone you mentioned. I took a course with him. I've taken a couple of courses with him over time, but he talked about an experiment they did, I think in the Netherlands with cats and they had a, a cat allowed to um, move around like a, a normal cat and another cat that was not allowed to move uh, on its own early on, but was in was, was only carried around by a machine, and the first cat developed depth, depth perception, and the second cat didn't. And you know, with human infants, the the first sense that we with which we identify things in the world is generally taste. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't an infant doesn't look at things and say, oh, you know, I'm seeing a picture frame on my desk, or even a brown thing. It's it's how does that thing taste? 
And if we all think about it, we can probably, we probably all know somewhere deep in our memories, what do car keys taste like? Um, what does sand taste like? We all tasted those things. And that was part of, you know, part of what sedimented in our memory that allows us to draw the distinctions we draw today. So Interesting, looking yeah. at how all knowledge is you know, constituted through habit formation and in habits are many, many layers of experiences that have coalesced through association over time. So that's a model for, you know, a very generic model for understanding how learning happens. So, um, yeah, the baby's always, uh, you know, they have their finger and they're sucking and all that. And Cause I guess the first, uh, they, they, I'm just talking like a lay person right now, um, you know, first thing they do really is they suckle right they survive mm -hmm. right yeah. and so their focus is on that experience i would say right yeah uh, in, in a way uh, so tastes and also sound before even they come out that's uh, so since i'm a sound guy i'm a very biased person on that yes. front right uh, you know um i think hearing before they come out recognizing the, their mother's voice i mean there are studies right that, yes uh, that show that um, they have a special thing for their mom and then for in general for human beings talking mm -hmm. um and so it's interesting that those are the first two senses that um that are predominant it seems to me hearing um uh, whereas seeing i mean they've been nine months in the dark and so all of a sudden they are this this just you know you know blinding world of light that's coming in and I, I guess your point, it takes time to, do, to start differentiating depending on the kinds of experiences that you are, that you undergo, I'm assuming, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, and then in, in the, so within, all, within that nexus of, of senses, how does the phenomenology um, approach come into play? Well, um, let me, let me think. Uh, one of the main contributions, I think, to studying the integration of senses is from phenomenology is recognizing that it's it's going to be layered and it's a matter of associations. Or that, that at least this is the insight from phenomenology that Sam and I have worked with most. That mm -hmm. uh, in it, it's actually we'll get to this. It's probably better the uh, habit forming fin, um, dynamic is actually probably better reflected in a neural network than uh, the, what, what we've worked on, um, but that, that's a... Okay, so it's um, the recurrence, perhaps, seeing... Seeing that, that you know, you know A you and mom, B are linked, yeah. You know, you know you, and then seeing, okay, associating, and then it's, it's through repetition, I guess, right? Yep. In a way. Repetition is a key, yeah. a key facet here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Sam, we'll get to you. Um, I'm anxious <laughs> to get to you. I just want to get sort of lay, lay the ground in the foundation here for some concepts. <clears throat> um, so as you know, so there's repetition. As you know, I told Sam, and maybe I told you too, I'm sort of the losing kind of a guy, right? For the lose is difference, right? Repetition and difference, right? That uh, his, his, his view is, um, is we're able to, we're looking always for difference to, to establish meaning, right? But there's this interesting, um, this, this di dynamic or symbiosis be between repetition and difference. You can't have difference with repetition. You can't have repetition. Um, we can't have repetition as meaningful without differences, right? So you start, you know, and then the, the fascinating thing is that babies don't need 3000 images of a ball to figure out that this is a ball. Maybe they see two or three instances, maybe one. And then from there, when they see the next ball, they say that's a ball. And then the question becomes, well, how did they how did they do that? Right? Clearly, they're not using what is now the the established way of going about doing things, which is collect lots of images of a thing and then I don't know, and then look for similarities, perhaps, right? Uh, whereas a baby perhaps can tell that this is a ball and this is not a ball because the differences are too vast. I don't know. Maybe I'm just trying to sort of uh, um, 
trying to uh, find the delta between your uh, your approach. I'm sorry. Let me kill this guy. It's one of the things in my checklist I didn't do. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. Um, so, um, what I uh, what I'm trying to get at is, um, I'm trying to see the difference between talk, talk about different difference between the current statistical approach, which needs lots and lots of data, and find similarities than your approach. Maybe this is a good segue to Sam, perhaps. Um, but before we get there. Um, at at the at the at the strategy level, of uh, the two types of algorithm, how is the second algorithm informed by the phenomenal phenomenology, uh, beyond habit, right? How how where where do where do you intersect between between the theory and the nugget of 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 of, of thing within the the theory that can be operationalized, and then we can move on to Sam. Okay, perfect. Um, I think that this is something that I, I can answer and set up, set Sam up really well. And I think your question is excellent for showing how is it that a baby can recognize a ball after one, two, or three, and it might take a computer 3,000 images. Um, I think we'll be able to speak directly to that question. Um, to bridge the gap, I've got to bring in one other concept um, from philosophy. Um, what I was doing my dissertation on was probably going to be the intersection of phenomenology and ethics. So there was an, and uh, there's a, there's several philosophers who freely, um, who are very open to mixing the ethical insights of Aristotle with some of the uh, theoretical rigor of Husserl. And I've fallen into that, that tradition. Um, there are several ethical traditions in philosophy that will focus a lot on the so-called trolley problems, moral dilemmas or conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. Aristotle has a slightly different approach uh, where he puts a lot of emphasis on virtue and virtue is you know a habit of perceiving feeling acting and judging in situations well so such that you can get through them smoothly um, so for Aristotle a virtuous person generally doesn't face moral dilemmas or conflicts of interest because he's already he's very skilled at avoiding getting into those kinds of situations in the first place and in Aristotle's understanding, such a person is skilled in that way because he recognizes features of situations that are perhaps morally salient or important or relevant that other people overlook. And by having that knowledge of, uh, or the sensitivity to morally salient features, he just escapes situations that, that puzzle the rest of us. So, how do we get that general awareness? One, for Aristotle, it's a matter of practice, but it also is an outcome of a natural curiosity that we have about the world. We want to be aware and sensitive to all the distinctions that show up in our experience. Now, this is something that Husserl developed uh, pretty rigorously, he, he defined pretty sharply, where he distinguishes between our practical interests, where we have judgments about what's good, what's bad in given situations on the one side, and our theoretical interests are just general curiosity that begins right with the beginning of consciousness in what appears to us, what kind of, what can we associate, what do we distinguish? And it was with that sharp distinction, setting aside practical affairs and seeing that we just have this natural curiosity, this theoretical interest in distinctions, that, uh, that that's a key concept that we used for developing a, a new form of AI. Now, this was late last year, we were asked, uh, we have, we're investors in and our father runs a data analytics, analytics company here in Tampa. We've got one main product and our dad asked us, we've, he said, we've got cool tech we've developed for this product, but it, we've got elements of this tech that clearly have broader applications than our product. So he said, I want you two to figure out what we can do with it. And we realized one of these algorithms comes very close to Husserl's account of association, which is, you know, the fundamental um, function of consciousness. So we took the algorithm that we had and we tweaked it to make it more generalizable where we, to the point where we can take a data set, we feed it into the algorithm, 
and it will show us all of the theoretical distinctions you can draw in that data set. Now, it wasn't all us, our chief data scientist has worked for 40 years on the systematic use of randomness uh, in computer science. And we, by using some of his techniques and this concept of a strictly theoretical curiosity and interest in all the distinctions that arise in our experience, we could tweak our algorithm and get something where we just take data set of, what any, of whatever type, though currently we just work with text and say, what distinctions appear in it? And that's kind of, it doesn't help us solve practical problems, but it gives us the whole array of distinctions available, some of which might be important or relevant to practical decision making. So Sam, I think I can flip it to you here if you wanna talk about um, really how, maybe in a little bit more concretely, how that does allow us to pick up on like, maybe we could recognize a ball after a couple instances rather than a couple thousand instances. Well, let me, let me frame, um, yep, yeah, thank you for that. Let me frame the question since she, she, she said that uh, you're focused now, you're applying it to text, right? Um, so, so that we can get into the nitty gritty of what you guys do and try to tease out differences between your approach and that of the currently established approach, which is statistical, you know, uh, analysis, right? So, and let's take within that, let's take the, the problem of sentence completion. Um, okay, uh, so today sentence completion is done uh, through brute force, right? And I see the manifestations of the brute force um, in the following way. Uh, brute force means, I think they collect plots, for example, even more specifically as far as sentence completion, let's look at Google's sentence completion within Gmail, all right? Um, so there, there's a, there, is a, there is a setting where you can say, yes, please help me complete my sentence because I don't have time, or you can turn it off. You know, I turned it off immediately because it was way too annoying. Um, um, but it also has um, sort of, it does a red underline if it's a typo, right? Or it's misspelling, fine, that's good, it's useful. But then it does a blue underline when it thinks that your sentence is um, weird and even though it is grammatically correct, probably it might not be what you wanted to write, right? Um, and so from there, you can tell that the reason uh, why it's doing the blue is because um, that phrasing is not normal, meaning a lot more phrasings are not like that than like that, right? Um, for example, you can say, let's do a meeting tomorrow, right? And it's just, uh, let's have a meeting tomorrow. But let's do a meeting. Is 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 there's a, there's a nuance between the two that uh, I would like to use, and there are lots and lots of examples like that, right? <clears throat> so that's an example of where it's using purely statistical, because the vast majority of, of the thing of the things it has seen are let's have a meeting. It says maybe you wanted to say let's have a meeting, okay? Um, so I just want I'm laying this out for the audience so that they understand what I mean when I say statistically informed algorithms. Um, so. Not that you, that I'm not going to ask you to tell me how you would solve that necessarily, uh, you know, in your model, but uh, how, how, how are you different, if that's the key difference, how you, uh, or, or that it's an interesting difference to point out to uh, highlight what you guys do between what you do and say that particular way of going about things, which is statistically informed. 